I, I'd like to introduce uh, David Schneer. Uh, David Schneer is a fellow, senior fellow for energy and environment at, for the Thomas Jefferson Institute of Public Policy. He's an attorney and scientist with 32 years of federal and private sector experience consulting on litigating local, state, federal, and international environmental legislative regulatory risk management and free market environmental issues. I'd like to introduce you, David Schneer. Thank you and good morning. I'd like to uh, run through an awful lot of stuff that you've seen before and I'm going to move through it very quickly uh, and try to get to the end where I think there are some original contributions you haven't heard yet. Uh, in, prepa uh, in preparation for this, uh, uh, this talk, I, I had a civil discussion with representatives of the, the global warming community who we call alarmists and it went something like this. <laughs> And then I had a civil discussion with representatives, those who think we're seeing natural warming cycles. These are the skeptics, as you know, and it sort of went like that. And then I uh, listened to them debate it amongst themselves, and that was pretty much uh, how that worked out. And I, and I make this point uh, because in 35 years I've been working in, in environmental issues, I have never seen so much division and so much unwillingness uh, to come together, which is why this talk is really uh, called the uncomfortable middle ground. It is the area in which people are going to be forced uh, to come together uh, for political correctness purposes. And uh, I will lay out the reason why, and this has not been discussed much at this session, why the alarmists will be forced um, to get to where they have to agree to some things that we might agree with ourselves. Their first concept, of course, is to prevent catastrophic climate change, uh, ocean level rise being amongst them. Their concept is we're going to get a, a six, seven meter rise in ocean level uh, with a two, <coughs> excuse me, a two degree increase in centigrade. That's going to happen when there's 450 parts per million of CO2 or the equivalent thereof. And guess what? We reached 450 parts per million in 2005. So it's too late. The tipping point for melting the sea ice has already been reached. Uh, we are uh, going to lose all of Greenland, in case you didn't know that. The oceans are going to swell. One third of Bangladesh is going to be inundated. Th 25 to 30 million people in Bangladesh will be forced to relocate. They have no money with which to do it and nowhere to go. That's the threat. So to reiterate, it's too late. Don't have to listen to me to believe this. Uh, this is uh, one statement, emission reduction target laid out in the Senate bill is not enough. Who said it? The head of the IPCC. Another said, uh, to get past this climate warming will require policies that don't simply decrease CO2 emissions, emissions but re eliminate them entirely. Who said this? Ken Caldera and Matthews, two of the finest engineers in the United States today who are working on issues you'll hear more about later but they are uh, proponents of the global warming by greenhouse gas uh, theory. And then my favorite, considering the inertia of our present fossil fuel development, uh, we appear committed to runaway warming unless we cool the earth at least enough to restore the Arctic sea ice. Who said this? Jim Hansen. So that's that side. Now, our side. Now, this isn't exactly what you've heard from everybody else, but this is part of the argument you have heard Basically, we have these warming cycles. There's the 100,000-year cycle. It's taking a second to load, and you've seen it before, so I'm not sure I'm going to leave it. There's the 1,500-year cycle, the 500-year cycle. Notice, uh, in all of these, we're on the way up or we're at the top, and that's the real point. Here's the 40-year and the 11- and 22-year cycles. Once again, we're near the top, so it ought to be hot, uh, and, and therefore, why are we surprised? But the point is, there are some common grounds on what these impacts may be. The Earth is warming. All right, there are some that say it, not, it isn't, but there are others, even in our community, that says, yes, there's some warming going on. 
uh, and we can argue about how much, but clearly those who believe in natural warming say that we're up near the grand maximum or somewhere near it. And we also say this, and we always look back 100,000 years, a million years, something and say, see, it happened before. Well, if you go back and do that, there were warming events with significant ocean rise. So if we're willing to say it was hot a long time ago, we also should be willing to say it was flooded a long time ago. So even though we don't see a whole lot of ocean rise, we admit that it can happen. We also have a general agreement on both sides that these were associated with CO2. Now, that's not to say that CO2 caused it, but these were, CO2 was elevated when it was warmer, and this is not so much important about flooding of the ocean and warming of the, of the earth, but it is very significant with regard to ocean acidification, and that's a significant effect that is going on right now about which we ought to have some concern. Failure to prevent all of this, of course, could cause a catastrophic effect. Why is this an area of agreement? Well, if you agree that hot weather really does cause significant ocean rise, then you'll agree with this. And at least you would say, well, maybe it could happen from our side. And from the other side, you would say, by God, it is known, will happen if I build your boat. Uh, the, an important point is that both sides have agreed that with warming, or without it for that matter, that there are changes in local climates that, that harm local ecologies. They also some say and admit that they help local ecologies. But we're not talking about what, what's good because you don't get middle ground from what's good, you get the middle ground from what's bad. And so if you have a concern about uh, birds and be, birds being killed, then you know that when you put up windmills, you're gonna get bird deaths and that's gonna change the local ecology. And you're gonna see other kinds of events, but you're going to see them regardless. Now, what are the attitudes that these people have? Well, first of all, humanity does not have the will to reduce greenhouse gases to near zero. Nations will, however, reduce consumption if it would reduce energy costs. And that's an important point. If warming continues, big if, humanity will need to find a way to cool the planet if we don't want to have huge ocean rise, if we don't want to have some of the effects that both sides agree can happen with significant warming. And lastly, nobody really wants to take any steps to cool the planet if it would cause more problems that it'll solve if we could figure out what those problems might be. Well, in terms of responses then, what is it that's in the middle ground? Geoengineering, and that's what I'm gonna talk about briefly. It's the only way to cool the planet. There isn't any other way to cool the planet than to do something that causes the planet to cool. That sounds like a circular argument, but it's the bedrock uh, reality. Geoengineering might be needed to deacidify the ocean. We are losing coral in some places. If we lose significant uh, fish stock areas where we have uh, serious concern, and, and that is possible, uh, I'm not saying it's happening, but it is possible. Well, then we're going to need to do something to deal with that. And then <clears throat> we may need it, maybe, to sequester large quantities of carbon. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, we can do that. And, I'll, and you'll see why we can say this, because you'll see that there is actually a costless way to do it. Research ought to go on. I think everyone agrees research ought to go on. Some energy consumption can be reduced, and this is where I first introduced the concept you've heard before, the no regrets manner, which is to say, I have no regrets if you ask me to do something that will save me money. In fact, if you just tell me about it, I'll go out and do it on my own. Those are no regrets strategies, and people forget that that's the greatest power on, in our economic system. Uh, there are, I said research before, but there are some specific things that we ought to be looking at in terms of uh, uh, geophysical engineering that have not been done before and are getting very little money. We spend less than $10 million on geoengineering research a year, and we spend, was it $6 billion a year on the rest? There's an imbalance there. Let me get to geoengineering. The big one everyone talks about is what's known as solar radiation management. This is a chart you may not have seen, but portions of it you have seen before. The top chart are the, are the uh, things that force temperature to go up. This is the assumption about greenhouse gases that are in all the models. This blue one's rather interesting. This is stratospheric aerosols, and you notice there are some dips in it. Down below, this is the temperature 
uh, from 1880 to 2000 uh, for the globe. And you'll notice uh, whenever these stratospheric aerosols go flying upward, uh, the forcing is negative and the temperature goes down, and it goes down a lot. So if you look at the Mount Pinatubo eruption, which occurred right here, and you have the temperature where it was, and if we put that much in the way of sulfates up in the air, you will end up with a temperature that is about four-tenths of a degree below where you started. So that's the concept. It's not hard to do. Uh, in fact, 15 years ago, 16 years ago now, National Academy of Sciences said it can work and we can do it. I will talk a little bit later about whether we ought to or what the other effects that we don't want come from that, but bottom line, can it be done? As recently as yesterday, I saw the final edition of a paper that's in press that's going to evaluate a lot of different ways to do this. We're talking about maybe a thousand weather balloon type balloons up a day to deliver these aerosols. Another one would be, I think it's 15 fighter aircraft running five missions a day. This is every day for, for a long time. And uh, so the technology's there. The cost is so small that it's considered costless by the economists. It's a billion dollars a year, which if you're from Washington, you know a billion dollars a year is something you can get from a vending machine on the floor of the house building. <laughs> and so it, it's not a question of whether you can do it. It's not even a question of who will do it, uh, really. It's just a question of when it will happen, because if Bangladesh is concerned about truly flooding, and talk about this, by the way, that Bangladesh issue is not 23 feet. It's one meter. One meter rise in ocean level, and you lose a third of Bangladesh. Even they could scrape together a billion bucks a year to do this, and someone will. So there's a whole debate going on now about how you do it, who ought to do it, how you ought to govern it. The uh, next one I like, uh, and I love this, this is a, a uh, description. And by the way, it's not alone. There's another one back in here if you look very carefully. This is a remotely operated uh, ship. It's about, I think, about 150 feet. It's not small. And it just wanders around. It's wind-driven. Believe it or not, that design is driven by the wind. Some guy somewhere has got a little joystick running it around. And he runs it 90 degrees to the wind. And it blows seawater up in the air, sort of like a, a whale would. And the water evaporates, and the little salt particles remain in place. And some of them move up into the atmosphere, and they form clouds. And the clouds shade the earth and increase the amount of rain, and it's utterly safe because nobody worried about salt falling out of the air. And uh, it's not very expensive, and there's no carbon footprint other than the building of the equipment. And this concept has been uh, reviewed in the peer-reviewed literature, and in fact is a fascinating idea uh, for weather modification, if not for global cooling. The other one that's been big in the news is iron and urea ocean fertilization. Uh, iron fertilization, there are two companies that are doing that. One just failed and went out of business. The other one just got a $4 million infusion of money. The question here is whether all the growth in the phytoplankton uh, is such that a lot of it dies and falls to the bottom of the ocean, which is the concept. The concept is sequester the carbon in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and the problem is we don't know how much it actually falls out. It could be as little as 5%. It might be as much as 50%. Until somebody knows that, this is a, an interesting idea, but certainly not one we know will work. Nevertheless, uh, there are people already starting to do it. And if we ever get into cap and trade and all of that, you're going to see people trying to sell credits from doing this because urea is easy to find, cheap, and there are lots of places where you could put this stuff. So the science on this needs to be done. And frankly, it's harmless if, and it's fairly low cost. Uh, if, if greenhouse gases cause no problem at all, it's still a sort of neat idea because it will dramatically increase fish stocks in the ocean. And we've been doing an awful lot of fishing out there, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, de uh, ocean deacidification, I just want to mention a couple of things. There is a paper out from Harvard and uh, Penn that says uh, that there are ways to take acid out of the ocean. It's a weathering process. Apparently, it uh, turns things back into rock. And they've conceived of a way of doing it that speeds this up. So what would take millennia can take decades. Uh, these take plants that look like uh, large DuPont chemical plants. That's the size. And they'd need a lot of them. They're not cheap to run. 
they would run on electricity, so you'd have to do that. Uh, but you could, in fact, uh, reduce the acid in the ocean. This is something worth looking at. Uh, and then there's ocean liming, which a lot of people said uh, isn't going to work, but uh, I know people who have already started trying to do it. So we need to look at uh, these kinds of approaches because, frankly, our reliance on the ocean is great more than most people realize. Then there are the low-tech things, and I'm rather fascinated by at least one of these, no-till farming. This is where you don't plow the ground. You, you run a, uh, what's called a knife through the ground, stick your seed behind it, cover right over. The crop grows up. You just take the seeds off. Everything else you smash down and lay on the ground. You plant a cover crop in the winter, and all that carbon goes back in. This is a good process, increasing the soil carbon. Runs for about 20 years worth before it really sort of reaches equilibrium. But you can put a lot of carbon in the ground that way. And it has a lot of additional benefits because it reduces the pollution from, well, you don't get any silt coming off the ground anymore. You don't, the nutrients stay in the ground. They don't go in the river. There's a lot of pluses on it. So in and of itself, it's one of these no regrets policies because it improves profitability of farming. And by the way, it sequesters carbon. And then one of the favorites I've got is a brute force technique. Take all the carbon related stuff, whether it's old trees, uh, you know, cow poop, uh, you know, you name it, newspapers, bale it up, take it out in the ocean and drop it on the bottom and create a new seam of coal 150,000 years from now. It would work. It is brute force. It is carbon sequestration, and it's fairly cheap. So if you really, really, really feel you have to do it, there are some ways to get there. Now, I want to, this is very difficult to read and, I'm, and there's no reason for you to even try. I have a paper, I think it'll be available uh, through the Institute, but this is uh, a discussion of ways to abate carbon uh, emissions. And the important point is that there's this group here where it costs, you, you, you save money if you do it. And this group is where you have to spend money to do it. And right about here is the point at which it's 12 bucks a ton. And that's what we're going to see in Congress. They're going to say, you're going to cap and trade, but you don't have to do it anymore if it costs you more than $12 a ton. Keep in mind, the current price in Europe is $40 a ton. So you're talking about a cap and trade program that will have almost no significance in reality. But the real point is that there are things you can do now that save money, and guess what? People are doing them. I don't expect you to be able to read all of these or read them quickly, because uh, there's one more point I want to make before I finish, and I suspect I'm getting close to my time here. Uh, but there are things that, that are typically common. When you build a building, build it better. Uh, don't spend crazy money, but there are things you can do with regard to standard insulation and windows and the like. Uh, that will work. Uh, go ahead and replace old water heaters. Uh, use modern coal mining methane, methane management, which also keeps people from being killed. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do. Hey, buy smaller cars. You want to pay less for gas, buy smaller cars. These are all things that are in the no regrets list, and these are the things states are going to be agreeing to force people to do, which they should be willing to do anyway. Then there are some of the small regrets ones, things that are less than 12 dollars per ton. And I think the real critical one here is nuclear power. Uh, if you don't like coal fire power plants, then you better be building nuclear power plants because we need the electricity. And that debate is going on nationwide now. And I think that one is going to erupt like an ugly boil before long. And nevertheless, it's going to be a critical point. This, if you really are uh, willing to do something, I think the middle ground includes the middle ground is going to include nuclear power. It has to. And then there are the high cost strategies. And I always like this list because they're terrifically stupid things you can do. One of my favorites is the LEED program. Uh, did I mention that I'm from EPA? And did I mention that I am not speaking on behalf of the agency today? Uh, I want to make that clear because the agency is fully defined and involved in that. And there are some good things in the LEED program. This is the green building thing. But the one everybody talks about is this uh, heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning, high efficiency stuff, uh, and it is not worth the money. It's a very high uh, cost way. But there are others. Hybrid automobiles, another one everyone talks about. Not a really bright idea in terms of cost. Photovoltaic, very expensive. These are things that will not be required under a cap and trade system with a $12 
cap. Now, the last thing I want to mention is this chart, and this is an important point. Whenever people talk about geoengineering, they say, oh my gosh, what are the adverse effects associated with it? Well, let's look at the three strategies that we can use, one of which is the uncomfortable middle ground. You can do nothing, which is sort of what folks here would say, no problem, see you tomorrow. And there's a chance of ocean rise, maybe a half, 50-50 uh, chance, uh, flip, flip the coin. We hear people talking on either side of this. But it's still, compared with the others, it's, there's some chance that if we are going to have a natural cycle that gets us truly warmer, we could have ocean rise. So there's that, that risk. The risk of uh, ocean acidification is fairly high. Uh, if it's just caused by CO2, clearly it's going to happen. If it's caused by warming as well, and there are good reasons why that would happen, uh, CO2 uh, gets pulled into the ocean water. That, that's a problem. And then this local ecological change that we talked about before. Well, it doesn't matter what, it's going to change. We know that. Things are going to happen when weather changes. Well, let's look at the, at the alarmist side. For their theory, ocean rise, well, 100% going to happen. It's already too late. We have that risk. We have to confront it. God forbid. Ocean acidification, it's already manifest. CO2 caused it. We've got that problem. God forbid. Local ecological change, it's absolutely going to happen. We just don't know where or what it's going to be, but God forbid. And then there's this middle ground that says, all right, we'll use geoengineering to, to cool the earth. We'll use no regrets for greenhouse gas reductions, which we'll get some out of. And we'll do a lot of research, which, of course, is based all of this on no theory at all. And that's not unimportant. We know that you can do greenhouse gas reduction. We know, you, with no regrets, we know you can geoengineer. So this isn't theory. We, you, we can do these things. As for ocean acidification, you're not, we don't know whether these things will work all that well yet, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a skeptical scientist. I'm willing to say, yeah, there's a shot. And I think it's a coin flip right now. I think these things can work. The question is how much we'll spend. As for local ecological change with geoengineering, yeah, it's going to happen. But it's just like this one and like this one. We don't know where and we don't know when. Uh, I saw a paper, it's coming out in about six weeks, uh, that's going to take a shot at this. Ken Caldera has done one that uh, has been published already. Some people like it, some people don't. The reality is, until it, somebody does it, we have no clue what will happen. And the beauty of geoengineering is, it's like a thermostat. You can turn it up or turn it down. If you're going to fly the aircraft and put the sulfates or something like them in the air, you can stop at any time. Just say, folks, we're done today. If we have a volcanic eruption, you don't put anything up there. Let the volcano do it. If it's just cooling, you don't even start. And so this notion of, of risks from it are minimized by the middle ground. And while it is in very uncomfortable for the, both the sides to come here, the reality is they'll have to. And they will have to because there isn't anything else that people can do on which they will agree. And so that's the concept. That's a little bit of the geoengineering, and I would say, uh, in all honesty, the likelihood of any of this geoengineering or any of the uh, uh, other kinds of approaches that we will be able to hold back and use will never be used. And they won't be used because it isn't warming. When it doesn't warm, we won't need them. So that's the concept, and uh, I think it'll be fun to watch and see how it comes out. Thank you very much.